Hello, this is lecture 27 on fossil fungi, part of the geology 6350 invertebrate paleontology and paleobotany class at Utah State University. I'm Benjamin Berger. So fossil fungi. So fossil fungi. So what are fungi? Well, fungi is a eukaryotic organism. It includes things like yeast, mold, like moldy bread, and mushrooms. Now, fungi have cell walls that are formed out of chitin. So they don't have hard parts like many fossils that are, are organisms that are preserved as fossils. So the fossil record of fungi is fairly limited uh, because uh, fungi aren't really hard. They don't have necessarily hard parts. Now, there's three kind of major groups that are associated with the term fungi. The first is the Oomycota. The Oomycota are the true fungi. So when we think of fungus, usually we're thinking of the Oomycota. This is, has an older term of a Amascomycota. Um, they're the true fungi, and they all have cellular walls that are composed of chitin. Now, you may remember that chitin is also the same material that we see in arthropods, in insects. Um, so it's that uh, chitin that forms their uh, exoskeletons. And so it's the same type of material. Now, there's two other groups that are oftentimes included within the fungi. These are the um, myxomycetes. The myxomycetes are basically the slime molds. These, the older term that's used for the slime molds are the gymnomycota. These um, slime molds uh, differ from true fungus in the fact that their cell cellular walls are composed of cellulose. This is the same material that we were talking about with fossil plants. The other group is the oomycetes. The oomycetes um, are the water molds. Um, these ha also have cellular walls that are composed of cellulose. And all three of these groups have a fossil record, which we'll look at in this lecture. The study of fossil fungus is paleomycology. And so we're going to be some paleomycologists today study some fossil fungus. Now, one of the things that's happened most recently is sort of regrouping the various groups of fungus. And this has been done using molecular phylogenies. So this here is a very complicated evolutionary tree of many different modern groups of fungus, looking at their molecular makeup, their genetic DNA, and comparing that using a maximum likelihood analysis. Now, the interesting thing about analysis like this is that there's actually um, two major groups that we can recognize. The first is a very monophyletic crown group, a very diverse group that's at the top here. In fact, they had to kind of draw another sort of tree branch there coming across for all of these. This is the Ascomycota, or also known as the sac fungi. This is the largest group of all of the fungi that are living today. They include uh, penicillin, which is where we get our antibiotics from. They include the brewer's yeast and the yeast that we use to make cheeses. Um, it includes the lichen groups, so the groups that form the various lichens that we see. Oftentimes these have sort of a sac-like feature that where you get the uh, spores that are developed, and so that's why they're often referred to as the sac fungi. Um, very diverse group includes some of the lichens as well, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. The other group that's kind of interesting um, that you're probably familiar with is another monophyletic group here shaded in blue. This is the basitomycota. The basidomycota are oftentimes referred to as the higher fungi, and they include many of the mushroom groups. Um, some of these uh, are um, parasitic on plants and cause plant diseases. Others are form the, the mushrooms that we're familiar with today that grow in various gardens and in the forests. There's five other groups, and I'm not going to mention all their different names, um, but they are the more primitive groups that sit outside of these two uh, kind of crown groups that we'll talk about their fossil record. Now, how do we go about recognizing the fossil record of fungus? I mean, they don't necessarily have hard parts. And so one of the things that we have to look for is something that's very unique to fungi that we can uh, recognize in the fossil record. And one of those structures that we can look for in the fossil record are what are called hyphia cells. 
HyphaEa cells are unique to the fungal groups in these three various groups. HyphaEa cells are basically the cells that kind of grow out sort of in dendrical fashion, sort of like little branches of cells that go out and kind of seek out the, uh, the environment there. They are basically the main part of the growing uh, fungus. Now these have certain structures. They're eukaryotic cells, so they're going to have mitochondrium, they're going to have uh, ribosomes, they're going to have a guy apparatus, sort of the, uh, a nucleus, so they're going to have all these complex uh, intercellular organelles within each of these cells because they're eukaryotic cells. Now the other thing that these, um, th what we can observe is that these hypea cells lack chloroplasts chloroplasts provide for photosynthesis and we should not see any of those in these eukaryotic cells. The other thing that we look for is um, septa. And I'll mention those septa here. The septa are basically uh, portions of chitin that grow within the cells and this provides a sort of a, a structure, a, um, hardness to the tissue as the um, fungi grow to give it strength and rigidity. Now you're probably familiar with seeing um, a bunch of these hyphia. Uh, when you look at a piece of moldy bread, you can see this kind of growing of these cells as they sort of spread out kind of like roots um, growing across the moldy bread um, that provides that mold that you see. And this is the real main body of a lot of fungi. Now, fungus reproduce in a number of different ways. And it's a very complicated system, much different than what we're going to see with uh, plants even. So fungi can reproduce both asexually and as well as sexual reproduction. When they produce uh, asexually, they oftentimes produce uh, spores, a whole bunch of spores. These spores are developed from fruiting structures. And there's two types of fruiting structures that are seen in fungi. The first is the sporangium. Um, and these basically form little fruit bodies that kind of come up and sort of explode and have little spores that shoot out. The other group are the condiophores. These are basically another group that tend to be uh, not as packaged as much as the sporangium. So they tend to be a little bit more spursed. The other type of asexual reproduction that we see in fungi are hyphia fragments. This basically means that the hyphia, as it's growing and moving across the substance, um, they basically break apart and form these, these um, segments, and those can form new uh, fungi, new individuals, and that's another way of reproducing asexually. The other type of asexual reproduction, what we see in yeast, is budding. That's where the cell basically simply divides, much like a bacteria does, and sort of buds off, and you get two individuals that are identical, so asexual reproduction there as well. Now, sexual reproduction can happen in a number of different ways. In yeast, you get these alternating uh, cycles, alternating generations between asexual budding and sexual um, coming together of cells to share um, genetic information and reproduce sexually. Um, so you see alternating patterns. There's a group of fungi called the zygomycetes. The zygomycetes um, basically have mating of the hyphia. So the hyphia, as it's coming close to each other, they'll meet at a certain point and they'll exchange genetic information and they'll produce a spore called a zygospore. The zygospore will, will exist between those two individual fungi and uh, it will be reproduced uh, sexually in this case. Um, now, ascomyocetes forms um, when that hyphia meet, they actually form a sac, a sac that's called an ascus. And the ascus is that sac that develops. And we see this in the as ascomyocetes, that major kind of crown group within fungi. So they produce a bunch of uh, little spores that are produced sexually within these sac-like structures. And then we have the basidio Mycetes. Basidiomycetes are the club uh, fungi and the mushrooms. And they form a structure called a basidium. And the basidium is basically the, the mushroom head that you see uh, with mushrooms. These are formed from the fused hyphae that come together. Uh, they reproduce sexually, so they start sending uh, sexual information. But then they form a stalk that comes out. It pushes up through the ground, 
and then has a cap and has these gills underneath it. And within those gills is lots of these sexually reproduced uh, spores in the basidium that then can be spread um, and come out underneath the cap. Sometimes they can be uh, kind of shot out very high up into the air so they can be transported a far distance. The largest basidium ever recorded of a living mushroom was 640 pounds. It was discovered, or <laughs> it was growing in the Kew Gardens in the United Kingdom. Um, and this is a picture of it. Um, sadly, I think it eventually passed away and broke up and became smaller over time. Um, it got kind of water damaged over time. But this is the largest basidium, the largest mushroom that's been recorded. Over 640 pounds, pretty big big mushroom. Now there are over a hundred thousand modern species of fungi that are known. When you look at the fossil record there's only about 500 fossil species so fungi are pretty rare as fossils. Now some of the things that we look at for trying to find fungi in the fossil record is looking at single-celled sort of fossils. Um, single cells are going to help tell us a little bit about the information of them. So we look for things like yeast that might form from budding and forming these blasconii um, that you can see here kind of forming these sort of interesting structures where one is smaller than the other. This is a little bit different than how many other eukaryotic uh, cells divide. Um, we also look for hyphia. So we look for cells that are developed in these kind of different ways of hyphia, whether they have septum or they don't have septum, and kind of looking for these types of structures within the fossil record. What we're really kind of looking for is the mold, right? The mold is called mycelium. That's the technical name for mold. And these are basically all that hyphia. We're looking for evidence of this mold in the fossil record. Now, the other thing about fungus that we should remember is that all fungus are heterotrophs. These basically means that they're living on organic matter. They fall into two different groups of uh, feeding. The saprotroph are basically groups that feed on decaying matter, decaying leaf matter, or decaying or any sort of decaying organic matter that they can feed on, right? So whether it's a peach or a piece of bread, something that's decaying that they can feed on. The other type of fungi are the endosymbionts. These basically live on other organisms, in this case mostly on fossil on plants, and we're going to see that in the fossil plants. Um, but they can also live on other organisms, living organisms like insects and even people, fungus living on people. So plant symbiosis um, has a fairly long fossil record. There's a group of symbiosis called mycorrhizae. Uh, symbiosis. Mycorrhizae symbiosis has a fossil record back to the Devonian period. And in Mycorrhizonian um, symbiosis, these fungi are associated with the um, tree roots or the um, plant roots that are growing in the soils. And so the fungi is basically living within the roots, within the soils, um, providing nutrients for the plants, but then the plants themselves providing a source of food for the fungi. And then we have the endophytes. The endophytes are basically um, groups of fungi that have a symbiotic relationship with plants by living actually on the plants, oftentimes on leaves. So endophytes basically are fungi living on leaves. Um, we have an extensive fossil evidence of uh, endophytes uh, living on leaves um, from the fossil um, leaves that we find, particularly in the late Cretaceous and into the Cenozoic era. So this is kind of an example here of some of these endophytes living on a leaf here that you find falls to the ground, can get fossilized. And then we have an example of that. Um, so we can see evidence of fungi oftentimes is associated with um, these endosymbiotic relationships between fungi and plants that are in the fossil record. Now, one of the interesting things is the symbiotic relationship between cyanobacteria and fungus to form lichens. So lichen is basically cyanobacteria, which is a single-celled um, blue-green algae that grows, um, photosynthesizes, and a relationship with fungi, 
and they live in a symbiotic relationship. So the fungi basically help break down the rock that this is the cyanobacteria is um, living on, provides nutrients. The cyanobacteria basically are photosynthesizing and providing food for the fungi. And so they both kind of live together in a very uh, symbiotic relationship on these rocks. And they live in very harsh conditions like places like Antarctica and the Arctic. So you'd think that these would have a very extensive fossil record because maybe they were some of the first life to come out of the ocean, right? Because they can live in many um, harsh environments. Now the evidence in the fossil record of fossil lichens with the symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria, um, the first really good record that we have comes from the Devonian, from the um, Rye Chert of Scotland. And this is an incredible fossil if you look at it. Here we have strips of cyanobacteria that's growing here. Um, and then encased within here we have some of fungi that's growing. And so here's kind of a little anatomical sketch of what this looks like. So here we have the cyanobacteria that's photosynthesizing. And here then we have the fungi that's living in close association with the cyanobacteria on these rocks. So pretty amazing sort of preservation that we have in the um, Riley Chert of Scotland, one of the kind of classic fat, fossil fungi places to go. We have fossil lichen that extends up in the Miocene. Here's an example of some lichen um, in the Miocene. Now the earliest record is this record, um, which is a little bit questionable whether it's related to modern lichens today. This is a record that comes from about 600 million years ago, 635 to 551 million years ago in China. Um, it was described a few years back. Um, and this is a, if you look at it, you can see that there are these little cells in here with height here that are coming off. They're living within, um, possibly associated with a sort of an algae and an aqu aqueous sort of marine uh, environment. Um, and so this may be an example of some cyanobacteria algae sort of um, relationship with some fungi that may have arisen independently of lichens. Lichens appear maybe um, appearing sort of in the Devonian or even uh, in the Silurian, maybe in the Carboniferous. And that about that time period, we start getting some of the lichens. Now, one of the things that we can do is try to use the modern record of fungi and use molecular clocks to kind of figure out when the various groups sort of originated, since we don't have a really good extensive fossil um, evidence of all these different types of groups of fungi in the fossil record. Now this is a kind of a um, uh, phylogeny that's sort of stretching back into the past to kind of see where the divergence kind of happened. Now one of the things is that during the Carboniferous where I've drawn this red line here, we actually have most of the major groups of the different groups of fungi start to appear in the fossil record. Um, and we get the two major groups, the um, bass Didiomycetes and the ascomycetes uh, separate out. So we get the two mushrooms uh, coming about during the Carboniferous period and sort of the sac-like um, uh, fungi uh, appearing as well, including the yeasts and some of those appearing around the Carboniferous. Um, but one of the interesting groups is this group here that's labeled Glomus um, that has a fossil record that goes all the way back to the Ordovician. And it's sort of the ancestral group to these two crown groups of fungi. And this is um, an example of the fossil that's um, found during the Ordovician. This belongs to a group called the Glomurocoda. The Glomurocoda um, basically um, have a fossil record that goes all the way back to the Ordovician um, with this amazing fossil from Wisconsin. These are considered ancestral to the Oscomyocoda and the Basidiomyocoda. And one of the things we can recognize with this fossil is that it has a hyphia, and the hyphia is coming out through here. And one of the things that characterizes this group is they don't have septa in the hyphia. So it's kind of clear. This is a modern example, and here's the fossil example. And a really close relationship with this Ordovician fossil. So the evidence is pretty strong. That we had these guys appear in the Ordovician. Now the, the Globemaricota um, are a group of obligate symbiotes. They live in the roots of, tre of trees and plants uh, in the soils, and they appear to have evolved um, and been closely associated with plants as soon as they appear in the terrestrial realm. And so these, um, these organisms of fungus basically came in and were living within the roots of these plants as soon as they 
um, sort of colonized the land. Um, they formed things called arbuscules, and you can see example arbuscule here. They have these very large um, multi uh, nucleate um, spores with kind of uh, layered walls. And the other characteristic is they don't have septa. They don't have any septa in the hyphia. Um, and so that's one of the characteristics we can recognize them in the fossil record. They're not a very um, a diverse group, and part of that may be that we just don't aren't able to study them because they're so closely related to the soils. It's oftentimes difficult to extract them from the soil and study them independent. And they're they are very microscopic. They're very small. Now there's two groups that are no longer really kind of considered within fungi. Um, that do have a fossil record that I thought I would talk about. The first are the slime molds. Ooh, slime molds. Now they kind of have a weird uh, life cycle that I would mentioned. So they start out as spores, and these spores are um, produced through meiosis. They go out, so these are um, haploid um, cells, so they're kind of like equivalent to gametes. And they go out and they break open it, they form either a um, amoeboid sort of cell that can kind of move around and slime around, or they form a flagellated cell that can kind of swim around with a little flagellate. Um, they come together, two individuals that come together, and they form a zygote. And when they do that, they form a, then a diploid, so they have both, um, both chromosomes. They then, when they become a zygote, then they start to feed, they find food, and if they find an abundance of that food, they start to multiply, and they create a feeding plasmodium. Now these mature, and they spread out looking for food, 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 and eventually they will kind of feed on everything that they can find, and they'll then have no more food, so then they send up a young sporangium, and then within the young sporidium, then we have all these spores and the stalk. They break open, they get up into the air, very small, spread out over a very large area, the forest, and then they can fall out and then grow into a new area. Slime molds are very bizarre and strange, and we're still trying to kind of figure out what they are and kind of how they behave in a, a forest and in their environment. Now there is a very, very small number of fossil slime molds, so super rare in the fossil record, but there are a few. Um, the best one is from about 34 million years ago in these Eocene oligocene amber um, that's been discovered in the Dominican Republic. Um, some examples of slime molds there. Um, there's been some suggestions that slime molds may go back at least a billion years in Siberia. Now the evidence doesn't seem as uh, strong for that, but you know there might be some slime molds out there. Uh, discover in the fossil record. Hmm. The other group are the water molds. These are the oomycetes, and um, unfortunately their name seems to indicate that these are groups of fungi that live in the water, and while some do, most of them actually live on land. Oftentimes they're parasitizing uh, plants that live today, and uh, they cause many diseases. Probably the most well-known disease is the potato plight. Um, this is what wiped out many of the potatoes that were growing in uh, Ireland and caused the Irish potato famine. This includes, um, this basically includes a species called Phytophthoria infestanus, as well as um, the mildew of grapes, which also caused many grapes in Europe to not grow. This is Plasma para vitcola. Now, there is a pretty good fossil record of Umayacete fossils. Uh, many of these come from those coal balls and from chert. These are found in the Riley chert, is the earliest record of good fossils, and this is an example of some Umayacete fossils um, that we see. You can actually see a little bit of the hyphia that are also found in the Umayacetes of these um, um, coal balls. Um, we also, this is an example of um, some oomycetes that were found in the Permian of Antarctica growing in stems. And you can see these interesting hyphia that develop these rings. They're very characteristic of modern groups of oomycete that we see uh, living today and sort of infesting plants. Um, here's another example. This is from the Carboniferous, one of those coal balls. And you can see here we have a uh, example of this um, um growing within the wood of this uh, carboniferous um, uh, tree. Now, 
One of the weirdest and strangest fossils that's out there is a fossil called Prototaxius, um, discovered from the Silurian um, and extends up into the Devonian. Initially, this was discovered in the 1870s, and the original describer thought that this may have been a, a, some sort of log that had been sort of completely sort of cannibalized um, by decaying uh, feeding um, fungi that lived on it. Um, but more recent studies have seemed to suggest that um, this is actually a very large, one of the largest uh, mushrooms growing during the Silurian and Devonian based on some isotopic evidence of looking at the carbon. Um, what's really cool is when you look at these um, structures in thin section, um, which is what you have down here, the wood, the kind of the wood structure um, to these are basically hypia. You can see how each of the cells sort of grew um, much like a uh, mycetium, much like mold growing and forming this very large mat of, of tissue that's formed out of chitin, which is pretty cool to think about. Now these grew during the Silurian, which is about the same time in which land plants, things like kukai, um, start to appear. Um, and we'll talk about as we have vascular plants growing on the land. And these actually probably rose were even higher than some of those early plants that probably were only about three feet in height. Um, and so fungi um, really kind of has been part of the terrestrial environment going way back in the geological history. And this is just a wonderful kind of strange example of uh, some of these weird fossil fungi you find in the fossil record. All right, that completes this lecture on fossil fungi. I've loaded up a quiz for you to take, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.